Welcome to the Couch GM Podcast. Today I have on Jared Bayless, who is a relief pitcher in the Seattle Mariners organization. He has a unique background as he went to school for exercise science as well as psychology. We have a great conversation talking through his background up to this point, as well as how he has applied some of those principles that he learned throughout school and applied it into his everyday life as a professional baseball player. He's posting a lot of great educational videos on his Instagram at Jared Throws. Also make sure to check out his blog, jaredthrows.com. And so if you're hoping to learn more about how the body moves and with pitching, make sure to tune into this podcast as well as checking him out across social media platforms. If you'd like to support the Couch GM brand, make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. I'll also put a link in the description below to all of my social medias. As a reminder, I am a mortgage loan originator during the day. So if you're thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing, make sure to reach out via DM or visit my website, lenderconnorweb.com. And if you're looking to find a Christmas or a birthday gift for a sports fan, make sure to check out glance-led.com. Use discount code COUCHGM on the Glance LED ticker to save 10% off and you'll help support the channel. And with that, let's get into the podcast. All right, welcome to the Couch GM podcast. Today, I am joined by Jared Bayless, who is a pitcher in the Mariners organization. So first off, Jared, really appreciate you uh, taking the time today. Absolutely, Connor, man. I'm excited to be on and looking forward to getting a chat with you. Yeah, so I first initially saw you really on Instagram and with what you're doing with your page. Um, and then I look at your background and you have a background in exercise science as well as psychology. So I'm really curious to hear about your background, how you got to where you are right now, and then working into your educational videos that you're providing for pitchers that want to, you know, learn more about how to use their body properly to mm -hmm. get everything out of it that they can. So let's just go ahead and start with how you got into baseball. Yeah, cool. Well, I got into baseball. I was a little older than most guys, but I was pretty big. Uh, so throwing came a little bit more natural to me, I guess, in that sense where I was just a little bigger. So maybe I could throw it a little harder. So uh, baseball is a sport I liked. Uh, because I was bigger and could throw harder like I remember playing on the like the 42 foot mound and I was just blowing noise past everybody <laughs> yeah uh, so it was a blast I was like six foot in fifth grade so like six I foot really fifth grade? yeah like I was wow. nearing it nearing it not I will <laughs> I'll say uh <laughs> nearing it um yeah. but so since then you know I've only grown like you know, four or five inches. So like, relatively speaking, I was a very large kid. Um, and so baseball was something I was good at. So that was a sport I liked the most. I played football. I did track. Um, I played basketball. Basketball was actually one of my favorite sports growing up. Um, but I dislocated my knee, my patella, dislocated it. It was kind of an issue, but <clears throat> ended up having surgery for that. And hasn't bothered me since, but it was around that time that I was like, you know what, like I've got to focus on baseball. Like I knew I wanted to play college athletics. I knew um, getting a scholarship was going to be a really good chance for me going to a, just, you know, another college than the local community college. I knew that was going to be a good option. So um, I knew very early on that like, this is what I want to do. And then I went to play some perfect game tournaments. And I got to see, you know, some big name guys, like guys that are on the top prospect list, you know, when I was young and there's guys blowing Chad, like throwing 94, 97, like 15, 16 years old. And I'm like, oh, wow. Word. Okay. Yeah. So it just really opened my eyes to, I'm going to have to get a lot better. Like <laughs> these are the guys I'm competing to go to college against. This isn't even considering professional baseball. So that's not even in my mind yet. Um, but I'm like, man, I've got to get a lot better. So then I realized um, I'm going to have to work. Like, it's not going to come easy. And I didn't mind doing some of the stuff that other people wouldn't. So this kind of like was the start of something that I call uh, low skill, high effort things. And it's really where I try to like maximize my career is doing things that uh, they don't require much skill, they just require effort that are kind of, you know, surefire way to get those marginal gains. Uh, so I knew uh, the more I could stack up aspects of player development like that in my favor, the better I was going to be. Uh, so then, you know, I get into junior college and I, well, in high school, I'll say I was getting recruited to play in a lot of schools, bigger schools. Um, and I got an 
injury, just a minor injury in high school and my velocity dropped, they all pulled the scholarships. Uh, so now, you know, it's really intimately I'm learning like, hey, if I'm going to make it, I'm going to have to work for it and I'm going to have to get a lot better. So I'm just committed to this process of if I'm going to be there in a couple of years, I need to like really uh, emphasize this. And then I go to my first junior college at San Jacinto uh, in Houston. Great junior college, always really competitive. And I threw two innings, missed the cutoff for the red shirt and got cut uh, for the postseason roster. Uh, and they pulled my money. Uh, so again, I'm faced with this kind of uh, constraint where it's like, hey, if you're going to do it, you're going to have to get better really quickly. Um, and then that's around the time that I start training with a lot of these weighted balls. That was like a really big part of my career um, and giving me an opportunity to play is I realized that there are aspects of training that can like give you a really big return on, you know, where you want to be. And so I started throwing a lot harder. Um, and then I had a series of kind of cool relationships where my junior college coach uh, previously played at Dallas Baptist University, which is where I went on to play out of junior college. Uh, really competitive school out of Texas, uh, if you haven't heard of them, but um, had a great time there. And they're all about development. So it was just kind of like these themes coinciding. I found a place that's like my home. Uh, I knew as soon as they offered me, that's like where I want to go because they're going to give me a best chance to get better and kind of like grow this aspect of myself that I've already kind of chosen as something that I want to do. Uh, that coach goes on to play coach for the Mariners. Uh, so I followed this coach around. So um, I'll wrap up my time at DBU. Um, and then two of my coaches from DBU end up being employed by the Mariners. So more connections being made. Awesome. So it just kind yeah. of feels like looking back all along, it's like, as much as I would have wanted this journey to go somewhere else or be quicker and not been cut and not have scholarships pulled, um, it really all kind of cascaded into making things unfold the way they have. And mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the story of this past year is just being okay with that. And I feel like for so long, it was like, you know, I should be here. Like I should be further on. Like I shouldn't be dealing with this, like an injury or a setback or whatever it is, but, you know, fully trusting that, I am where I'm supposed to be. And uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up there with, that's kind of how I got into Pro Bowl. And awesome. that was like, I guess the first three chapters. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, oh, yeah, that's a good story. And it's always kind of funny how things do really fall into place, how they were intended to. And that mm -hmm. really makes, especially when you go through the adversity that you've mentioned so far, once you do reach that milestone that you're, or that box that you're trying to check off. Once you do reach that, you're just, you're able to appreciate it that much more. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. So at what point did you decide? And I assume that you majored in college in yeah. either exercise science or psychology. And how did you decide to go that route? Was it because of baseball that you decided to look mm -hmm. at it at that approach? Yeah, that's um. so the way I got into college or with education is in high school. Um, you know, I had a big head. I was like, dude, I'm going to go play college baseball. Um, I'm going to get that scholarship. I just got to get the minimum ACT to get in, like, and it'll be smooth selling <laughs> from there. I'm going to be a big leaguer. It's all good. And then, you know, I get to college. That first semester is not going the way I thought it was. Um, but I also realized learning, you know, this is going to sound pretty cheesy, but I realized you can learn whatever you want. It was like a superpower. Mm -hmm. As much as you wanted, you could go get it. And so I really enjoyed like being good at school at that point point. and high school, my grades were good, but I was just getting by, by, you know, just kind of raw ability, not really applying myself in that aspect. And then, yeah. um, that first couple of semesters of college, I was like, dude, give me 15, 18 hours. Like I've got to make the most of this. I've got to learn as much as I can. And, uh, when I got to Dallas Baptist, it was the first time where I was like given an opportunity to specialize, you know, in junior college, you kind of want to get a general studies degree so you can make sure that you transfer out um mm -hmm. it's not all your classes may transfer to the four-year school that you go to so i did bias the sciences because at the time i thought i wanted to be a physical therapist okay um but when i got into dallas baptist i got into exercise science and had a great head of that uh part of the college adam ross uh, was our strength coach at the time at dbu and um, he had a really tough class. So he really forced us to kind of like, you're going to learn it and you're going to pass this class. You really got to learn it. And so 
I guess that's kind of coinciding with the Instagram, how it started is uh, the way I kind of run my Instagram is I want it to be a living portfolio for mm -hmm. when a time came and I was done playing baseball. I had a living resume that you could go see and see where I had uh, started out and, you know, kind of how I've evolved my training or the topics and principles that I was discussing on that. Uh, so I knew like same thing with my education that I wanted to set myself up to have a good, um, you know, job availability post baseball. And yeah. I think that's uh, something that we, we lose as um, athletes is everyone else has time. They can go get an internship. Uh, they can go do volunteer hours and they can really build up that resume. But as a baseball player, you're playing summer ball all summer. Uh, you don't have free time in the fall to go get an internship. Uh, so I knew I didn't have the opportunity to kind of like make myself appealing on paper for a resume. So this was kind of like my creative way of through my education, preparing myself for that as well. But the Instagram kind of, that was like the way it started originally. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, as you're talking about, you know, baseball players don't have much time. It's like when you're not on the field, you're probably trying to recover, to eat, to sleep. You know, you're just exhausted from all the work that you're putting in on a day-to-day -day basis. A um, couple questions off of that. The short, short question is, do you have a YouTube channel yet? And then number two is, I'm curious the difference between you know, exercise science versus physical therapy. I feel like a lot of those classes would be under the same umbrella. So at mm. what point does that split off and what exactly is exercise science versus like physical therapy or kinesiology, that type of thing? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't have a YouTube channel yet. I would love to, but um, I'm learning to edit content and getting familiar with like Premiere Pro and some of the Adobe Suite products so i'm trying to uh to learn what i can but it's a lot of work it's a lot of you know ideating content behind the scenes to to make the most of your time like so i'm growing so not yet but i would love to have one in the future um and i guess kind of like one thing i've always wanted to do for youtube is i would love to have a channel where i could practice with someone else that's you know well regarded in their sport and see how good I could get at their sport in a day. Like I've like really come to like enjoy this like training process. And I think mm -hmm. um, it's not really like, how can I become the best baseball player? Like I want to be the most, I want to be the best athlete I can be. Yeah. I think that's going to set me up to have the best, you know, specialized skill of being a baseball player. If I have a really robust skill set as an athlete first. Mm -hmm. um, so I would love to be able to do that. I think it'd be super fun. Like just to like, like a video series of going and playing yeah, football just, for a day and yeah like and learn from these guys because i know um you know sport is so beneficial because you know it's not training the athlete it's training the person the person is the athlete and i think it's a subtle distinction but our sports not only do we mend ourselves to be good at our sport the sport mends us as well and helps us become better people and i think it would just be a great avenue to to learn you know um baseball has different you know, attributes and the culture behind it than basketball or football and how that manifests itself in the people that are successful in that field. Like, I think it'd be a great conversation. So that's something I would love to do in the future. Uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, but as far as like exercise science and physical therapy is I'm not really sure. Uh, physical therapy is a lot more school. You got to go and you got to become a doctorate of physical therapy. Um, and that's like three years where you can only take a few days off a year. Um, it's just not very feasible for someone who's still playing or a college athlete if you wanted to get a head start on something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so like off the bat, I was like, well, that doesn't seem very realistic that I'm going to graduate at 23. And then whenever I'm done playing, hopefully at like 33, you know, whenever, yeah. um, go back to school for three more years and it'd be super rigorous and not having been practiced and the information like i was just like this isn't very realistic for me um and now like i said it's it's become much more like how can i draw on this information to help me as an athlete like initially it started out as i don't know how long i'm going to be playing this game i got to set myself up for a good uh post baseball career avenue um and now it's kind of like let's let's make this all be one thing instead of viewing it as two concurrent things like it's just one thing and it's trusting that all this information is going to help me be the best athlete player and person that I can be. 
Uh, and then just trust that that sorts itself out down the line that I know if I give a hundred myself percent of myself to this, that, um, I don't really have to worry about propping myself up post career, but those kind of things will just sort themselves out as I, you know, thankfully, as I continue to play baseball, I get to meet with high performing people that, you know, I am guaranteed they're going to be doing great things and, uh, the field of baseball afterwards. So just the networking of now just playing, uh, professional baseball has been huge. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get into um, kind of what's your approach as far as let's say someone's trying to learn pitching or to be more efficient in their their pitching technique. Where mm -hmm. where does someone start from the very beginning with how you'd recommend taking a look at what they're currently doing and then mm -hmm. assessing from there and tweaking? Dude, it's so much goes into it, and it's like that's like uh, the past you know, 15 years of my life or, you know, 12 years of my life, however long it's been, um, has been just refining each and every one of those aspects because what it takes to make it, um, is it's not just the tactile skills of the sport, like being able to sweep the slider and, and locate the two seam and pick guys off and, you know, hold runners on base, all that does matter. Um, but if you as a person, you know, aren't at a level to where you can, display that upper end performance of yourself regularly and whenever necessary, um, then it doesn't matter how good your curveball is or how well you can locate. If you can't access it very frequently, um, you know, whenever you need to. Uh, so there's just so much that goes into it. Um, but, you know, one thing that the guy I train with, he has a saying, it's called train like a child. And, um, you know, kids are fearless. They're willing to learn anything, you know, I feel like as we get older, we kind of like educate ourselves to, you know, be a little bit more timid with exercise and, and lose that creative process. Um, because I think like just playing, you know, um, I think that impacts a lot about how you go about training. And I think, you know, for a lot of guys, it's, we've been coached into the way you should throw like air quotes, the way you should throw or the way it should feel. Uh, so then you're layering all these expectations onto the throw. And that's kind of like what I've really tried to apply in my career this past season or past few years is limiting those um, layers that I'm layering on top of the throw. As I think about, I know this is going to be super abstract, so let's see if I can communicate this, <laughs> is um, like Google Maps. Like you have where you start and where you want to end up. And there's several routes, like there's a neighborhood that we could navigate to get to where we want to go. Mm -hmm. And um, the more you're layering expectations on, you're constraining the amount of options that you have. So if you're like, well, coach said I need to sit into my hill and I need to do this and that, then ultimately you're giving yourself less uh, motor options to complete that task or less roads to drive on to get there. Uh, so it's really became like applying variability and making it really hard to challenge myself and kind of like train the stability of the skill so that if it's example, like throw a slider with this sweeping shape to this location, it's how can I stabilize that skill so that if I'm moving a little bit more posteriorly, I can still maintain and execute everything I need to. I can handle that disturbance and it not affect me. Um, or if I have a little bit extra momentum because I shuffled into it or stuff like that. Uh, so that's been like, one of the bigger things and just communicating that to athletes, realizing that you don't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be a super cognitive process where you're conscious and you're, and you're working your way through it. And I think a lot of times as kids pitching is like the super meditative process where you're like, you're really kind of in your mind and it kind of disposes kids to, uh, if you have an issue and you're already in your mind and you know, that's the only tool you have, you're going to try to fix it with that. Um, so you're going to try to use your mind to fix it. And then you're just kind of in this internal battle and then it suffers your performance. You know, that's not where you want to be. I think the best place you can be is where you're, you're, you're fearless. You're not timid. And then you, however, your body sorts itself out this is the way it sorts itself out. And I think that's usually when we're our best selves as well. So train like a child, I guess is the way I'd say it is just forget everything you've been taught and just go be good. Like, honestly. Yeah. And do what's natural. Cause uh, I mean, growing up, you know, I pitched throughout high school and then I still play adult league baseball. So I'm still trying to learn how to pitch. You could say, uh, um, okay. but you know, growing up, 
a coach will teach a kid how to pitch and they're like have a certain thing in that coach's mind that they mm -hmm. want the kid to do that might not be working for the kid or especially long term so mm -hmm. i'm curious first off you know how you find that natural pitching motion the arm slot i know you have a pretty low release mm -hmm. um what i was told recently in in the prior years was like act like you're a shortstop and try to feel the ball like a shortstop and throw it and mm -hmm. however you're going to be throwing it right there is probably going to be your best bet at getting the most out of your throw so and then yeah it's been a matter of i feel like if you're the, the less you have to think on the mound the better you'll be off because you know i had a teammate tell me like hey it doesn't look like you're using your legs too much and then in my head i'm like okay now i'm just focusing on driving off my leg and i feel like i'm yeah. not getting everything but then this off season you know i've been seeing some videos of a coach that's like hey okay uh, throw normally and then once he does it's like all right now use the uh, least amount of energy possible in order to throw it as hard as you can and then so the guy is super slow and then at the end you know he goes really hard and it's like the same speed but he looks like he's barely even trying so yeah. it's like now i'm focusing on just being natural and then like fast at the end so I, I know that was kind of a long response, but it's like the less you have to think and the more natural it feels. And then also if you could speak to the kind of whippiness and how you yeah. found your arm and all that. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, just the way you're talking about it, one thing that like I found and I've kind of broken this down and the way I view it is I think about, you know, where your awareness is. So like if you're working on the shape of a pitch, you're, you're going to be really concerned with the way it's spinning on the way to the target. You're trying to look for the spin. Like, yeah, that's the action I want, or that's a curveball or a gyro. You're trying to see the dot or whatever it is. So I think about, I know this is going to be abstract again. This is a lot of what it is, is like only things I've thought about with myself. So communicating, it's going to be, <laughs> we'll, be we'll see how that works. Um, but where your awareness is, is going to be like, just imagine for a second, that's where you physically are. Uh, cause whenever you're looking at the way the ball's spinning, you're not really concerned with the awareness of your body. You're not really actively sensing and tuning in with that. You're tuning in with the way it's spinning. And then if you were trying to hit a spot and you know, it's three Oh, and you absolutely have to throw a strike. That's all you're concerned with. Then you're not really concerned with how it moves or how your body's moving. So there's three different places. Your awareness can be, it can be over the rubber with you focusing on your body. It could be in between you and your catch play partner. And then it could be at the target, focusing only on location. And so as you go through your catch play, I think it's natural to um, bias each one of these three places. There's going to be a time where you need to focus on getting to your legs, you know, like you were saying. Uh, but ultimately in the game, you probably don't want to be prioritizing, um, right. you know, that. So it's kind of like, and then, you know, you're trying to get the shape of the ball. So taking moments where you're intentionally giving your mind confines of where it can exist, so to speak, to leverage that for your favor. So knowing exactly what it is you need to work on and then, and putting yourself in a position to where you can work on that and it'd be okay. Like if you're working on shape, um, you don't want to care about its location as much or potentially how you're moving as much. When you start juggling a lot of those and you're actively kind of thinking through them, it, it really limits you as far as how you can move. I don't know if you've heard of the term analysis by or paralysis by analysis. Oh yeah. Um, yep. But yeah, it's like the physical manifestation of that, uh, your body, when you're tense, like it flexes up, um, the flexors are more dominant and you kind of lose that rhythm and fluidity of the movement. So it's kind of like just being in the right place is huge. Um, sorry. I'm trying to think of the, <laughs> the, 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 I was just kind of responding to the way you're talking about and what you were working on. Um, oh, and then also, talking about using the arm like a whip and how I found my arm slot is that's been huge for me is one of my teammates. This is just a incredible story of Tim Elliott. One of my teammates who was with us with the Mariners, um, he was injured and coming back from injury and his velo wasn't quite there. So it was like, Hey, we're going to give you some time to, to work on this. And we don't want to put you out there in a position where you may not, you know, have the success or, the game's going to be different than when you before, because you're not throwing as hard. So we're going to give you some time to like, go ahead and build this up and work on this. 
Um, and he's working really hard, like really hard at this for a couple weeks. And then finally, um, he's throwing a bullpen and he threw 15 of them and took a five minute break. We call that an up down, like, cause mm-hmm. you're, you're throwing and you go down, you throw another one. Yeah. So he throws his 15. I think he's averaging like 89 miles an hour Hit a couple 91s. And then he throws like five more in the second set of 15. And our pitching coach is like, Hey Tim, I want you just to, he's, he takes a deep breath in. So as he's going through his windup, he kind of is like, and like takes a big breath in. And it's like, hey, I want you to just let that air go when you release. Uh, so then he said he would breathe in, and then at release, he would like grunt and let it go. And then he goes 91 and does it again, 93, does it again, 94, Jeez. does it again, ends up at 96 miles an hour. And oh, uh, just unbelievable. It's like, and it was super transient. Like in a moment, he gained seven miles an hour. Yeah. He started the bullpen averaging 89 and did 96 unbelievable it was just truly remarkable and i was talking to him and he said it felt like whenever he let go of the ball that there was no energy uh left in his arm it was like weightless it wasn't like he was trying hard after release it was like he tried hard it built to a peak he let go of the ball and then there was no energy left in his arm because he applied it all to the ball yeah and so i started playing around with that cue of like kind of like slingshot in it like a like the old slingshot where you whip it right and uh and that's whenever i kind of found like my arm slot just becoming a lot more natural and i think a lot of that in part is due to the sequencing if you you know if you look at a whip the more proximal end of the whip closest to the handle needs to accelerate and then decelerate so that the next link of the chain can accelerate and decelerate so the next one can accelerate so there's this right. process of your your torso needs to accelerate and then decelerate so that your arm has time to take that momentum to the next link of the chain and then accelerate. So mm-hmm. whenever you apply like effort as a constraint, you're forcing yourself to sequence better. And this is something I do in my catch play all the time is I'll start out at like 120 feet and I'll say I'm not allowed to try any harder than I currently am it'll be subjective. Like it's not hard and fast, but just say, I I can't throw any harder than this with more effort. And then have your partner go back 10 feet, go back 10 more feet. And if you're able to continue to throw it further, you can optimize your angle, but it gets to a point where the only way to throw it further is to sequence better and to be more efficient. Um, Mm -hmm. So like pairing that kind of with the, the whip of the arm, you kind of like, yeah, I'm just, I'm using a lot of words and have used paragraphs to describe this but you learn it more intuitively. That's like yeah. one of my biggest pet peeves is like whenever an athlete tries to discuss something like this to their coach, I'm like, you're just in your head, you're overthinking it. And it's like, do you realize how complex like movements are, sensations are, and then just trying to effectively communicate it to someone so that they understand it? Like, yeah, you're gonna have to talk a lot. You're gonna have yeah. to explain it a lot. That doesn't mean I'm like actively piecing this together as I'm trying to throw, it's just kind of, I know it so well, I don't have to use words whenever I'm just going through it in my delivery, but to communicate mm-hmm. it, it takes a long time. And I feel like I've, if I'm speaking to any kids that that's happened to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's happened to me <laughs> all my career. Uh, but yeah, keep doing it. Keep tr- struggling to communicate it because it's in that process that you learn, you know, what you're trying to do and you get better at describing it. Yeah. And everything that you're talking about, some of the, the guys that might already be at a, a high level they're probably doing all the same stuff that you're already describing. They're just in their mind, yeah, processing it in a different way where they don't have the words to do that because that's just what comes natural to them. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, that's really interesting to hear. Um, so then kind of walk me through what does your you know week look like? What does a, a workout routine look like um, with what you're doing to optimize all these different functions? And then I'm mm-hmm. curious, like what your pregame routine looks like, because I'm sure you've got a process with that too. Yeah, I do a little bit. And my training, it's, um, it's a little bit more unconventional um, in the sense that not a whole lot of other guys are training in a similar manner. And it's, it's very subtle. Um, like I said, this is something that I'm very passionate about, exercise science. And, and it really comes down to just eliminating the, the randomness of getting better. There's so many variables and factors that 
you can't just like maintain in your head at all times. There's too much to consider. You would never get anything accomplished. So it's like, how can I give myself the best chance to have things go in my favor? And, you know, with that is strength training. And, and really what I've come to believe is it's the program that you're convinced by the most, the one that you fully believe I'm doing the work necessary to end up where I need to go. Um, and so for me, I have trained with some different people along the way, but ultimately I'm, I've landed with this guy that I'm training with now. His name's Brady uh, and his Instagram is like Dak Performance and Health. Um, is I'm convinced by the way he kind of goes about training is it's, uh, it's technically called an undulating periodization. So it means just ever changing. Mm -hmm. And the best way I can think about it is traditionally uh, people kind of have a block, right? So they would focus on hypertrophy like getting big for four yeah. weeks and then they would say okay now we're going to do you know a different phase power or force or speed or maybe they break it down to where one month is eccentric the next month is isometric the next month is concentric uh, the way this works is opposed to those styles of training it's called ever-changing um, in that i'm not really emphasizing one aspect over another and it comes down to just reasoning with is you're only as strong as your weakest link. And, you know, just kind of the, the historical like workouts that I've done is you squat, you bench press and you deadlift. And I know you can only create so many more movements, um, but I was just felt like I wasn't training enough. So now the guy I train with, we kind of systematically train everything from your toes to your fingers, to your wrist, uh, to these intricate ranges of motion with your shoulder, um, internal and external rotation. We train them with the same importance that we would a bench press or a squat. And just kind of traditionally, you know, in workouts that I've done, or I'm sure you've done like as you played, is you have your main lift, it's squat uh, and bench press. And then you have your accessories and you don't hit this accessories as often or as with as much intensity as you do the other stuff. Um, but, you know, I find that my body feels even better. So I'm doing a lot more work. I'm doing a lot more work uh, in total, uh, but I feel really good. And I think it's because of the way this undulating program works is I think about it kind of like a bubble. Um, and traditionally, if every Monday you have your upper body lift and you do the same workout the following Monday and you do those same exercises for four weeks in a row, you're only stressing that bubble in the same place uh, but if it's constantly changing and you're not following that super rigid program and you're training everything from head to toe then you're kind of bouncing around where you're applying the stress on this right. bubble so like you're distributing the load so I, I found that overuse injuries are a lot less common like my back always hurt whenever I squatted all the time and it's like I'm sitting here saying like, my back shouldn't hurt. I should be able to squat more. And my body is just like, I'm trying to let you know you shouldn't squat this much. <laughs> like maybe you should train the other stuff. Um, so it's really evolved to where it's a lot more of just like everything and, and not waiting um, something above another just arbitrarily because it's a bigger muscle and it's easier to train with the barbell, like is what it comes down to, I guess. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, training towards your goals. So if you're trying to get big, then yeah, the hypertrophy makes sense. But then if yeah. you're trying to get better at throwing a baseball, you're probably not going to be doing the same thing a bodybuilder is going to be doing. So figuring yeah. out what your actual goal is and then the most, most efficient way to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like there's a, there's a lot more stuff that like I, I've been adding in that I think is the super like lowest hanging fruit is. Um, I have this like ratchet strap essentially that I will like, you may see it. I posted on a video today, actually of me using it towards the end. And, um, I kind of attach it to a pole or to some object and then I pull against it and it looks kind of super unconventional and you don't see many people in the weight room doing stuff like this. Uh, but it's really cool. And I think it's specifically super beneficial for baseball players. Um, and like the reason is, is just cause that rope, it takes up tension. Um, in an instant. It, so you're applying the load to the tissues in a really short time frame, And that's similar to the throw is like, whenever your arm's coming up, there's no tension on the arm. And then as soon as you start rotating to the left and accelerating your arm, that tension and that 
stress is applied to the tissue like in an instant. So it's yeah. in a similar manner. So it kind of gives your body an opportunity to learn how to manage those collision forces and those stresses in a similar context that to what you would occur when you throw. Uh, so it's helped me like help my arm be more resilient and train those um, more tendinous properties of the muscle. It's been pretty sick. So I just wanted to explain that because it's a little bit more unconventional, but I think a lot of guys could benefit from incorporating it, that a little bit of that into their training at some, at some degree. Yeah. And then I just watched the video, the one before the, the workout that you described, <clears throat> you also have the dumbbell doing the tricep extension and you did the motion with your arm, kind of what the pitching motion is with yeah. the dumbbell attached to the band. So it's all the stabilizers in your arm are also working at the same time while you're working the, the big muscles. Um, yeah, I mean, that all makes sense. And I think that gives you a, definitely a leg up with your background and your experience with your training throughout school. And then you've been laser focused on this one goal and you've been working to, to grow your ability and your understanding with the science behind it, why you're doing it and where it's going to get you and what the end result mm -hmm. is going to be. So I'm curious, I've always asked this when I've been up asking pitchers of their workout routines, how many days a week are you lifting? How many days a week are you throwing? Because I feel like, you know, you can't be throwing every day or you can't at least be throwing intensely every day. You have to let your body mm -hmm. recover. So I'm curious what that looks like. And are you doing the same type of workouts in the gym off season as you do in season? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really for me, as it's become a lot of the same, it's, it's the same program that I'm running in season of Alice season. I may prioritize a couple of different qualities that I'm training just to like, if one thing is lacking significantly behind another, we may feature that into that rotation more, but it's really the same thing like throughout the year because, um, you know, I need to get better at throwing, you know, I need to get better at pitching a shape to a location on a mound with a batter in the box. Like that is what matters. So the more opportunities I can get doing that, like I'm all in for. So if I could keep it in season, um, I think like that would be like the best route developmental wise is just to keep going. So I was super thankful to go to the fall league and get a whole extra month of throwing high intense uh, game reps because I knew I was like, I've got a month that I can get better. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something I've always said is if I can get two to three months Un and like of healthy throwing end game, I know I can make significant strides because that's whenever we truly develop is not in training. I know it's easy to think you get better when you train, but the best opportunities that influence your performance are in a game performance. Those reps, they mean so much more. And when you punch out the guy and a base is loaded count and like a two out to end the inning, like, and those runs mean something, you're going to remember that rep a lot more than you did the, the 20 second rep that you finally got right on the throwing line. Like, right. It means more. Um, so yeah, my, my, my training is staying pretty much the same. It's like six to seven days a week. Well, it's like six days of lifting and one day I just kind of do some movement, um, mm -hmm. at the house, like on my own, it's still pretty stressful, but I found the, the more I keep it up, the better I feel if I take time off and um, I just don't feel good about like the work I did or like kind of the direction I want to go. But yeah, I'm the same true for throwing. I took a little bit of time off just because I've been traveling so much uh, this past week, um, but I can get back into it. And, you know, I really want to throw six to seven days a week. And like my end goal is like, I think it's totally sustainable to keep this process going with uh, the training that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um so like i'm really trying to prepare myself to where if needed i want to be able to throw in a game just uh like like six days a week honestly yeah <laughs> like i would they, like they that is you. my goal yeah. um i think i think it'd be really cool uh you know you have to be really good for a team to go to you six times in a week <laughs> uh so that also necessitates that i'd be really good at pitching <laughs> um yeah but just preparing myself to be able to do that like i think it's something that's actually attainable um, so with that being said, like in the season, I, I do the same lifts in the season. I lift every day in the season. Um, and it, it's freed me up 
before I kind of had some hesitancy, people say, oh, you don't want to be doing too stressful of an exercise before you go pitch. Uh, but I think ultimately uh, have a higher view of what our body is capable of. Um, going in and throwing 16 pitches, uh, I've prepared myself to a level that that's not, relatively speaking, not very stressful. Um, I can throw, sure. I can bounce back from that. Mm -hmm. So if I want to eventually be able to pitch in the big leagues six times in a week, I know I'm going to have to do a lot more than that, or at least work up to a level of performance where that is within my means. Uh, so I'm very much still growing and, um, and pushing in the season. And I think that's been like the key for me is this past year. Um, it was the strongest I felt I had the best month of my, my career, the last month of the season pitching in November when the season started in late February. Um, and so it, it excites me a whole year or two years now buying into this mode of training. And I'm starting to like see that it, it really pays off. Absolutely. Yeah. And just looking at your stats, I mean, you're doing well, um, you know, this last year in 2023, you were in a ball, then high a, you were, uh, pitched two games in triple a, but your strikeouts per nine is 11.5. So you're over one in inning. Your walks per nine is at like a George Kirby type level at 1.3 walks per nine. So, and I'm curious to hear, you know, with the Mariners philosophy of dominate the zone, what does the dominate the zone camp look like? And then, yeah. I mean, just speaking to, to your success, also a whip of 0.842, all those stats are phenomenal. So what had, What's been the driving force in that success um, so far? Yeah, I, I, there was a really big switch from the past couple of years to this year. And it was just choosing that, um, I guess, inadvertently, maybe subconsciously, just avoiding, um, you know, the uncertainty of, like, not pitching well. <laughs> like, that's a real thing that you have to, like, be like, I'm going to go out there and do everything I can. And if I just get rocked, I get rocked and being okay with that. Um, so I had a bullpen like early on in spring training where I was like, I wrote out every pitch and the location that I wanted it to go. And I gave it to the coach and said, Hey, like Mark, where I hit it. Cause I was like, dude, if I'm going to get exposed and this is going to be a rough year for me, I want to know now. So I can start like working on this a month before the season starts, like, and like use these next couple of reps to be better. And I realized just kind of like that was the mentality that I needed to approach with every day. I uh, was just like having just a fearlessness and relentlessness, just fully giving myself up to the goal. So it simplified a lot of things for me to where before I may have, I may have allowed myself to think too much while I was on the mound about various things. Um, but just like having just a very narrow focus on what it is that I want to do and then, okay, let's try to go do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, things like went a lot better this year, <laughs> um, things, uh, and it was more consistent. So like, that's kind of what I want. It's cool to see that like the, the throwing training I do is manifesting itself and like, um, throwing a lot of strikes. Um, so I know that's something that the Mariners, I guess I'll say is I've told my strength coach, Hey, I'll do whatever it is. You just have to convince me. He's convinced me of this training. So I do it. I've mm -hmm. told the Mariners. Um, hey, whatever it is you believe I need to do to get better, you just have to convince me. You convince me, I'm all in. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the burden of proof I put on my career. It's I only have one chance at this, and I want to do the best thing for me that I can prove to be true so that I believe it 100%. I can get my whole self behind it. I'm not holding anything back because I don't know if this is going to work. Well, the Mariners have explained everything like just so well for us on what it takes to be good. And I think one quote from, uh, uh, I think it, it was Andy McKay said this, talking about, you know, could be the best pitcher in the league. So if he throws majority of his counts, uh, throws majority of his pitches in 1-0, 2-0, 3-1 counts, he'll never pitch in the big leagues. He has no value. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's, there's stats that show, like, if you throw a ball in the strike zone in an 0-0 count, you have like a 94 to 96% chance of getting the ball back in your glove with one out or one strike. There's only a 6% chance that they put the ball in play and it's a hit or it's wow. a run. Wow. So knowing those stats, you know, you know, if you look at batting averages by counts, the count bracket, and as it gets to 01 and it gets to 02, it is a nosedive on batting yeah. average. So it's like, 
okay, the goal is to throw as many strikes as possible. And thankfully, um, I've leveraged myself to be like a very annoying pitcher by like dropping my arm slot over and like moving as far over to third base as I can to throw sideways. Um, so just throwing strikes gives me a lot of room for error because I'm throwing a pitch that if you take all the pitches that a pitcher has seen and you were to graph like a standard distribution of their release height and side, I'm not going to be in the middle. Uh, they're, yeah. they're just not going to have seen a lot of pitchers like me. Uh, so those pitches play better in the zone and it buys me a pretty big buffer zone of not throwing 98 either. Um, like I think my average fastball was like 91 this year. So um, just really buying into if those philosophies that they said about how influential it is to throw strikes are true, then that should be the only thing I'm considering is just, can I throw a pitch for a strike? Can I throw a pitch for a strike and being like, just having the, you know, the bravery just to throw it middle, middle, like, and, just and challenge being them. Cool, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So the off season leading up to the season, I would throw my low effort bullpens where I'm just, my fastball is like 82. I would throw those with hitters and I would tell them what pitch was coming <laughs> uh, because I wanted to be only concerned with, did I throw the ball where I intended to? I did everything I could. So what if he hit it off the yeah. wall and it was an 84 mile fastball? So I just kind of like really like when it comes down to it, it was just how much can I just buy into this and fully sell out to what is that I need to do? And let's see if we can do it. Let's try. And then let's try again and keep trying. Yeah. No, yeah. That takes a lot of buy-in because I mean, just the taking the ego out of it, and, mm -hmm. you know, like you mentioned in the spring training, just throwing the low effort bullpen to where you don't care what the batter does. I mean, I'm, it's tough to silence that noise in your head to where it's like, Hey, this guy just shelled me, but it's like, mm -hmm. no, it's like, I did what I was looking to do. That's all that matters. Move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Um, which, uh, which pitches do you throw? Is it a, is it a sinker and a slider, maybe a change up? Yeah. Um, and then. So it's just a matter of, yeah, challenging the guy. The OO stat definitely shocks me. So unless it's like George Springer, I guess just throw it right down the middle, you know, and yeah, and you have a pretty good shot. Yeah. So it's definitely throw it down the middle. And, and with that being said, um, I throw off speed. I throw off speed a lot. And I've thrown it anywhere from 50% of the time to 90% of the time. You know, it fluctuates based on the outing and, and based on my approach and how I want to attack these hitters. Um, but having proven that I can throw my slider for strikes this past year at over 70%, I think I threw over 70% strikes with my slider. Wow. Um, so I put the hitter in a position to where they, they have to be committed to swinging on a slider it is, you know, with a lot of, I'm not going to say most guys, but with, for a lot of people, your slider is your put away pitch. You know, you, you don't show it too early because you don't want him to get four looks at it and then at bat. So you're trying to put them away with a the pitch they've already seen so many times. Right. Um, so those dynamics come into play, but I'll tell you what, a hitter walking in, the first pitch they see, it being a slider that's coming from five feet behind them, um, They're not they ready to typically that. just aren't like super eager to go get that pitch. Right. So it really puts me on the offense, just proving that I can throw that pitch for a strike whenever I want. Um, because it, it just opens up my options. I don't have to do that every time I can do it when I want. Um, but you know, if the average pitch has a 6%, um, negative rate, you know, of throwing OO, I'm willing to take my chances throwing a slider that is proven to have like 200 points lower batting average, uh, on average, whatever it is, you know, sliders are just empirically harder to hit. So it's like, if you take a pitch, any pitch, and it's 94% chance of you getting the ball back. What happens if you take a great pitch? You know, is it 2% of the time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, is it 99%, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, so let's let's go find out. Let's see what happens. Um, so just kind of like, that's what I said. Like, that's another low skill effort task that I can leverage in my favor. That's something that not everyone has to do. Not everyone's required to do it or has to care about it. Um, but if I can take that information and leverage it to my favor, then why wouldn't I do it? Yeah. And then, so with your psychology background, um, are there, are there certain, 
drills or um, trainings that you do to train your mind? Or has it just been a buildup over time of, you know, a, you could say a humbling to where it's like, you've learned to just take the ego out of it. And, and you know, you're focused on just your one thing. Or do you visualize, um, you know, what does that look like? Yeah, I thankfully with the Mariners, we have an excellent mental skills staff. That's kind of the department that we have that, you know, will educate us on breathing practices, um, you know, meditation and how to leverage your mind ultimately to be a tool for you and not something mm -hmm. that's holding you back. So I've learned so much through them, uh, through Stephanie, through Byrne and Christian. Uh, they're awesome. They're really good. And they are willing to come alongside you in times where, you know, other people aren't. It's, it's hard to go up to a guy when he's had, you know, four straight terrible outings and, you know, at, oh, and begin that conversation, you know, how's it going? Um, so um, it's, it's really important to leverage that in your favor. And it's something that's been profoundly big for me, especially this past year is, um, you know, it impacts everyone differently. You know, imagine you're at your nine to five job and, you know, someone is watching you, evaluating you at all times, <laughs> the way you perform, if you do good, if you do bad, your body language, are you showing weakness? Um, yeah. And ultimately they could cut you and then you lose your insurance in 30 days and you have to figure out a whole new career. Um, right. So it's like pretty cutthroat. So like managing that and, and dealing with that is hard. And I think for the longest time, like I said, I thought what it took to be a big leaguer was you need to have a great slider. You need to have a great fastball. I need to be able to throw it to good places, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. It's being, you know, a high performing person as well to, to withstand that and to bring all those aspects together and to display them regularly. Um, you can't eat your cake and have it too. Um, it's both. You got to have all of it. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm realizing is, um, at this point, a lot of the biggest improvements I have in my game are not tactile skills, but just people thing, learning to manage stress better, learning to, you know, to plan and, and hold your, your vision for what you want and to really go get it. Um, and that was a big part of that for me this year was just is realizing that, you know, it's not guaranteed. No one's going to come help you. Like, you really have to look yourself in the mirror and see like what it is that I want and can I go create it? Um, so it's been, it's, it's been really big. And I think the biggest thing has just been um, bringing it all together. Like uh, the way I approach my life when I'm training um, and the way I approach my life whenever I'm doing the dishes is it's not like uh, they're two separate things. And if you're a really bad uh, person at home and you're, you're just like not locked in and you're not all those qualities that make you a good athlete as well, then like you really like haven't incorporated that into like your being and like who you are as a person. And uh, so I feel like a lot of it's just been combining all of that to just like taking the same, like whenever I go to a workout and I, you know, I realize that this is an opportunity to, to make myself into someone who can pitch in the big leagues, like taking that same level of intensity and engagement to, to all aspects of my life, to conversation with you. And, you know, uh, I think that, I think that plays in big because then when you go compete, you have a free conscious, you know, I think uh, a lot of people, you know, they have some kind of performance anxiety and, and it's a tough pill to hear, but um, you may not be doing the work necessary. I think you have to convince yourself. You don't want to, you don't want to be fearful and you want to be confident. Well, convince yourself that you're confident. Um, go do the work necessary uh, and do it over and over and over uh, until you can convince yourself that like, Hey, I feel okay. Like, saying I feel confident because I am. Um, yeah. And it's just like realizing that those symptoms, you know, that, that may, when things aren't going right, those symptoms of anxiety, you know, um, you know, having anxiousness about your performance, you know, dealing with an injury at recovering or not is, uh, is really just kind of like letting those go and not holding on to them too tightly. I don't know. Like it's kind of, getting more out there and I, I'm trying, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit. So, Oh, you're good. No. Um, so what do you do when you're off the field and you're just trying to de-stress, you know, mm -hmm. not think about anything. Uh, I feel like you might do some meditation also. Um, yeah. or, or like what kind of, what, what has helped you with that? I, um, yeah, I meditate. No, I'm not, not as very good at it. <laughs> I'm trying <laughs> 
Um, I have some meditations that I do. It's uh, this guy named Joe Dispenza. Um, I really like his stuff. And I've read his book, You Are the Placebo. And he just kind of talks about the placebo effect and, and how you could uh, leverage some of those aspects to, to you. And it's, it's a wonderful book, like super uh, convincing. Uh, and a lot of the stuff you read it and you're like, oh, of course, I like that make that just makes sense. Uh, so doing that, uh, trying to read more of this off season as well. I'm looking at a collection of books over there that I need to crack open. And nice. also I play disc golf just to like stay competitive. I also okay. like, I feel like it could be a bad thing for my arm either. Just like being able to handle more stress and, mm -hmm. and being able to do whatever I need. Like it's a lot of fun and I enjoy like being good at it. trying to be like, I want to be the first pro baseball player and pro disc golf player. I think that'd be pretty sick. But oh, yeah. Is there a, a professional way. disc golf league? Yeah. Yeah. It's a real yeah. thing. There you go. Yeah. I've seen videos on like TikTok of guys throwing it like a hundred yards around a bend between trees and that yeah. type of thing. <laughs> That's like, they, they like did like a four end competition where it's kind of like sidearm slot and guys are throwing it like 83, I think maybe like 86, 87 miles an hour. I looked it up and a disc weighs disc about golf? five ounces or with the disc. Yeah. Like disc golf. Wow. Like these are the best players, you know, they're signing yeah, yeah. like hundreds of thousand dollar deal, million dollar deal. Like they've got good arm strength and <laughs> they're good. But I'm like, Hey, if this guy can run it up to the mid eighties, you give me a five ounce disc. Like I bet I can, I bet I can send it pretty far. So, um, I'm trying to harness that skill and trying to like use my baseball. So that's the real reason that you found that arm slot was for disc golf after. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Getting that's ready awesome. for the tour. Um, yeah. And then how much, how much of a role does sleep and nutrition, those types of things play into it? Are you eight hours a day plus you have to get, you know, mm -hmm. it seems like you're pretty regi regi uh, regimented on what you do. So I assume that you're pretty strict with, with your sleep schedule and nutrition and all that too. Yeah. I wear this, uh, well, here it is, uh, this whoop, uh, yeah, tracks your sleep. Let's go. Oh, I'm sorry. always in the red, but <laughs> yeah. What's up? You're always I said in the I'm red. always in the red, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I know people are like, people call it the random number generator because it's just like, it might as well, it just always says I'm in the red. What's the point of wearing it? Right. Um, but no, it's crazy. I, uh, this thing, I love it. I love wearing it. I use it to track my sleep, but um, I've like gone through this, this phase where I used it, quit using it for like six months, used it again for like a year, quit using it. So I've gone through all the cycles of like, this is great. I'm like following everything it tells me to, to like, and then my first year of pro ball, we were traveling like every third day, driving on the bus overnight, playing at 7 PM the next day. So I just like turned this thing off. I was like, I don't care what this thing tells me. Like I can't help my sleep schedule. Right, um, right. But no, I, I wear it to track my sleep just to like, to see if I'm kind of going in the right direction. I try not to be like neurotic about it and realize, like I said earlier, I have a, have a really high view of what the human body is capable of. Um, people flourish in the craziest of conditions. And I think, um, you know, this thing shouldn't limit us at all. I think uh, it should only give you some confidence and supporting data to, to have good processes that set you up to go where you need to go. But I know so many guys that they'll get a red recovery score or they just won't even check their recovery score until after the outing because they're like, I don't want to look at it. And yeah. I'm like, no, that's not what that means. Like you can relax. Like, <laughs> so I do that. And I, um, I don't have like a super strict diet. I just, uh, I've, I've made a couple, you know, decisions along the way. I've gone through the phase to where I tracked all my calories. I planned right. out my macros. I've, I've done that, but I've kind of gotten to a point to where I just take, um, you know, what is going to give me 80% of the results without having to go that extra, you know, like 50% of effort. So it's like kind of like exactly. leveraging, like, I don't, I don't want to be like slaving in the kitchen and super neurotic and like gaslight myself into feeling like I'm not doing everything I can just because I, I didn't meal prep my broccoli today or something like that. Um, but then again, you know, I make it to the big leagues and you get paid like a professional, then uh, maybe it's a little bit easier. To, to eat like that you know who knows uh maybe i'll have a nice diet but for now it's nothing super special just try to have good habits try to shoot for eight hours of sleep you know don't be too hungry i try to get 200 grams of protein that's really hard though like 
unless you're just crushing a lot of meat and protein shakes but yeah yeah not really yeah um kind of a, a tangent to the whole sleeping thing i've heard studies that nose breathing is mm -hmm. better for you overall like the with the amount of oxygen that you're getting in or the quality of oxygen compared to breathing through your mouth i'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious if you have learned anything about that um with your schooling growing up or through your research after the fact um the reason why i'm asking is i've been using mouth tape recently to like you know tape mm -hmm. your mouth closed at night so that you're only doing breathing through mm -hmm. your nose and yeah. I'm curious if you tried that, if you've found that that helps with sleep and, um, and then also on the mound, you know, if you need to calm down, yeah. if you just take a deep inhale and they tell you to breathe in, breathe out through your nose, you know, yeah. what, what that how's it been out. working for you? The mouth tape. Cause I do the same thing. I'm curious how, I would say, I would say that I've been getting better sleep. Um, I don't know if it's night and day because like I said, my sleep scores are always in the red. I always go to mm -hmm. bed too late making videos. Um, yeah, but I, I do feel like I'm getting deeper sleep. Okay. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm getting deeper sleep too when I wear it. And the one thing I've noticed is I have less disturbances. Uh, so I don't, I'm not a snore. My wife hasn't told me that I snore regularly, but, yeah. um, maybe, you know, breathing through my mouth, like I just get slightly obstructed and I wake up, you know, like I have 12 disturbances a night where, you know, like you just barely wake up. Right. I noticed that whenever I'm out tape, I have less. So now you say that, um, that's about it. And, you know, I've listened to a couple, you know, Huberman podcasts, Huberman labs, right. where he just breaks everything down. And, um, I remember, uh, a speaker coming on and saying that it really doesn't matter. Uh, you're breathing through your nose or your mouth, like in terms of like activating the parasympathetic, uh, nerve system to like calm you down and down regulate you and relax you. Yeah. Um, that it doesn't really matter that it's just the duration of the exhale and that, that kind of like trips that nerve and helps you get in that direction. Um, but so I've tried not to worry. Like I used to, that was one thing when I'd meditate, I'd be like, you know, I have to be, I have to get this breathing rate down. So then I'd be so concerned with, well, is my breathing <laughs> right? Am I in my mouth or my nose? I'm in the wrong spot on this pre-recorded meditation. So then I wouldn't even be meditating. I'm just like constantly right. rehearsing the breathing cycle. So it's like, I would again, like, Hey, let's take a step back. Let's like, not really like just try to what I, what I really try to do with my breathing is, is not follow a specific practice, like very firmly, very strictly, like just take the guidance of it. If it's like inhale four seconds out eight seconds, just like do your best to be around there, but don't worry about the timing. What you should worry about is creating the feeling of relaxation. And like, that should be the goal. Uh, so as I've like shifted that to my goal and really tuning in with my body and, you know, if this breathing is true, then I, I should be more relaxed or I should be able to kind of notice those effects of my system and relaxing a little bit. So it's like, go make yourself feel relaxed. <laughs> I don't know, but um, that's kind of the way I think about it. Yeah, right on. And I'm the same. Um, I've listened to Huberman and I think that's where I heard about the mouth tip initially. So I was like, all right, give this a shot and yeah, it works yeah. out pretty well. But, um, Jared, really appreciate your time. It's already been, you know, past an hour time flies when you're having fun, I guess. Um, yeah. but yeah, we'll have to do this again. Make sure to go follow Jared throws on Instagram. There's also the website, jaredthrows.com to uh, learn more about him and what he's doing again, really appreciate your time. Looking forward to our next conversation and best of luck the rest of this off season. Yeah. I appreciate you, Connor. Thanks for having me on and feel free yeah, to go check out my website. I'll have a blog dropping on there soon. Just kind of going into more of those themes that we talked about on this past year and the biggest difference it was. So um, if you go read it, hope you enjoy it, but yeah, thanks again to Connor for having me on. You got it.